glad that you're all here. Thank you for coming today. This is going to be really interactive because I'm going to want to, I'm going to want you to get involved with the thinking and the talking about the food and the meal creation and all those sorts of things. And it may take a little different twist than you had thought it might today. So I hope it will because that's, you know, always exciting when it's different than you think. Um, this is something that I really have a passion for because I feel so strongly about feeding your family to feed your body. There's really only a few ways that we fuel ourselves. We fuel ourselves through food. We fuel ourselves through movement. So if we're not getting one or both of those, then we are not fueling our bodies. I just went to uh, Switzerland, to Swiss, this call, a place called Swiss BioHealth. I was there a couple of weeks ago. We took all the doctors from our office and went together. And um, one of the really sad things that he said is that 70% of the patients that come to the clinic there in Switzerland, well, most everyone that goes to the clinic there are chronically ill patients. 70% of the people that go are from the United States. And he said the reason is because 70% of the United States is chronically ill. So that's pretty sad. I just saw a couple of days ago there was an article on KSL that said that they're finding one in five teenagers are now pre-diabetic. Teenagers. This isn't even, this isn't even like old people, you know, <laughs> this is teenagers. One in five are pre-diabetic. So what's happening? Why is this happening? Why are we going to this place? I think a huge piece of it is food huge piece of it is food and it's so difficult today well it's interesting because I remember I had an assistant a team member a few years ago and she was really trying to lose weight she'd always been the chunky sister she hated being the chunky sister always her whole life she'd always been that one so she was really trying to lose weight so she was trying to you know utilize the resources we have here and the team members and their knowledge and all those kinds of things and she said I don't even know how to eat healthy I don't even know what that means or what that looks like and I thought how many of people in today's world say that? How many people who are cooking meals for your family say that? I don't even know what a meal, a healthy meal looks like. So we're going to take a little different direction um, in, this, in this talk today because I want you to not only know what a healthy meal looks like, but I want you to, to know how to make it taste amazing so that you're going to want to cook every single night so your family loves it and that you're really fueled through eating that way. So why do we eat? You know, my grandma was an amazing, amazing woman. She uh, had nine children. My mom was the oldest of nine, eight girls and one boy. Can you imagine that household? They only had two bathrooms. Um, I don't even know how they existed. But uh, she had to cook because she had 11 mouths to feed. And they didn't have hardly any money. My grandpa was a traveling salesman. He was always doing something different, and it, he was never home. And so she didn't have a lot of money. So she had to make a can of beans stretched to, you know, 11 people. It was kind of that sort of situation. So once everyone left the home, she stopped cooking because f cooking was not fun for her. Cooking was a chore for her. It was something she had to do. It was not something she enjoyed doing. She didn't really like eating. Well, that's not me. I love eating. <laughs> so uh, that's not a problem. But for her... You know, it, why, do, why did she eat? It was more just because she had to, you know. Why do you eat? Fuel is one thing, right? We fuel our bodies that way. Nutrients, hopefully. Satisfaction. I mean, you know, how many of us eat because we need it for an emotional boost or because we want to feel good or those sorts of things. Social activity, right? Sometimes eating is just social. It's just fun. So there's a lot of different reasons we eat. Why do you feed your family? Probably similar reasons, right? Because you have to. <laughs> Because everybody needs food because they're asking. Um, hopefully some of it's social. Hopefully some of it's a little bit educational. In our home, everybody cooks, so it's a little bit educational. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. But what gets in the way of you feeding your family the way you would like to? So I love this picture because I think that's the, the picture we think we have to be, right? I was. <laughs> you, you were? <laughs> well, I was one of those little kids. <laughs> you were one of those little kids. You weren't this lady? <laughs> no, I'm just... That was my era of, of yeah. eating dinner at the table with my family, you know? Yep, exactly. And the tablecloth was on and there were flowers in the center and you had china and, you know, the whole thing. And so I think sometimes we think that this is what it has to be, right? So who's ever said that they don't have time to cook the way they would want to cook for their families? <laughs> That's my number one. Um, money. I don't have money to do what I want to do. I don't know how to cook like I want to cook. Um, they don't like what I cook. Has anybody ever heard that? You don't like what I cook. Yeah. Um, picky eaters, food allergies or sensitivities, and just simply desire. You just don't like it. <laughs> you just don't want to do it. So my husband would be that. You know, thankfully, I like to cook because he doesn't. He just doesn't care. 
Um, so I have an interesting story to share with you that I think is just so funny. Um, these are some friends of mine, real stories, okay? Dave and Sherry, husband and wife, and uh, she was telling about the way Dave cooks. So she said the way Dave cooks is he finds a recipe that he thinks looks really good. So he starts to make the recipe, and then he changes a few things in the recipe. Then he goes to the fridge and he finds some leftovers that are in the fridge and he throws them in and then he mixes it all up and then he throws hot sauce and ketchup on top of everything. Sets it on the table, eats a bite and says, wow, that recipe isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was hilarious when she said that. <laughs> it's like, that's so true. So she said, now let me explain the way I cook. So she sits there, you know, and she explains the way she cooks. She said, what I do is about 3 p.m., I get a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach because I know that my children are coming home, my husband's coming home, and I have to figure out something to eat. And it has to be nutritious, good for everybody. Everybody has to like it. It has to be economical because they're on a budget. It has to be quick because, you know, she still has kids at home too. You know, she's listing off all of these things that dinner has to be. And she says, by the time I figure out a meal or I figure out a recipe that looks like it's going to fit all the criteria, and then I measure exactly every single ingredient, she's like, it's 9 p.m. And my family's all gone to bed. She's like, so some nights we just eat tater tots. So, you know, it was just so interesting to hear the difference in this husband and wife. She's like, so Dave's gotten a lot better because if he doesn't, we don't eat dinner before 9 p.m. or else we have tater tots. So, you know, it, I think that sometimes we fall into one of those two categories. And we need to find a middle place where we cook well, food that people like. It's nutritious. It's still economical. It fits in a time frame. There's a way to do it. It's possible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Where do you start? Have you ever felt overwhelmed? I love this picture. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Sure, I can handle it. No problem. Well, maybe so. Maybe not. <laughs> so where do you start? I love, there's a book that I've been reading. Um, I've been reading it actually for probably a couple of years. And I, it's one of those that I read for a little while and then I put it on the shelf and I read for a little while and I put it on the shelf. And I just picked it up again um, a couple weeks ago. And I'm so glad I did because it's really going to be the basis for the first part of what we're going to talk about today. The book is called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Has anyone ever, ever heard of this book? Yeah, it's such a good book. And there's a documentary that goes along with it. Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. There's a documentary. There's four, four uh, what do you call them? <laughs> four series, four, four yeah, things, you know, one for each of those. Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. The salt one is in Japan. The acid one's in Mexico. The, the fat one's in Italy. And the heat's in America. And she walks you through these different things. Well, the basis of the book is that if you can master each of those four things, you can master creating a meal that everyone's going to love. And you don't necessarily even need a recipe to do it. So we're going to talk through some of these basics. Um, master these things. So we're going to start with flavor. That's where we're going to start. Then we're going to start about designing a meal and some foundations, some tools of the trade, and some simple cooking methods that are going to get you there. So I want you to think, first of all, what do you like about restaurant food? <laughs> That's the number one thing right there. <laughs> Very good. Okay, beyond the fact that someone else made it, what else do you like about it? <laughs> well, it's you get tired of your own cooking. It's all in the presentation. If it looks good, mm. it's broken, it's good. Okay, so presentation too. Good. What else? What else do you like about it? There's lots of flavors. That's right. So flavors. There's flavor there. Not all the time, but most of the time, right? Okay. Um, the they other do the dishes. They do the dishes. That is another fabulous <laughs> advantage of a restaurant for sure. Um, are things usually cooked well in a restaurant? Cooked well, right? Uh, complimentary dishes. You know, when you get a meal at a restaurant, typically everything that you're going to get is going to go together, right? So I want us to think about some of those things, that depth of flavor, that, that, that it just tastes right. Complimentary dishes, things all go together, cooked well. Those are all things that you can do too. So let's start with the salt. We're not going to go to the heat, but we're going to do salt, fat, and acid because those three things together really do equal flavor. So, so let's start talking about salt first. It's really, really interesting. First of all, there's a lot of different kinds of salt. And do you know what salt is for? Do you know what it does? Flavor. Flavor. It enhances the flavor of the food. That's what salt does. It enhances the flavor of the food. And different salts do different things, and different ways that you use the salt do different things. So 
This goes clear back to high school chemistry class, right? You all forgot it. So, do you remember, in fact, I asked my husband the other day, I said, do you remember what osmosis and diffusion were? And he just looked at me like, am I supposed to care? <laughs> and I said, all right, let's talk about osmosis and diffusion. What osmosis and diffusion means is that typically every cell in our body likes to be in balance with salt and with water and minerals, not just salt, but minerals and water. So if one part of our cell, or if outside of the cell has more salt or minerals than the inside of the cell, those minerals are going to cross the barrier and come in and equalize inside of the cell, or vice versa. The water will come out and go towards where the more minerals are. Everything's going to balance. So the same thing happens in food. When you salt a soup, have you ever thought about this? I've thought about this. I've, I think I'm probably weird, but you know, I've salted a soup and then I'll grab a spoon to taste it and I'll think, well, but what if I don't grab the part that has the salt in it? But does that ever happen? No, like the salt's throughout all of it already. How does that happen? <laughs> That's osmosis and diffusion. That osmosis is actually going through a, a something, but diffusion is like spreading out. That's, that's diffusion. That's what happens how, when you salted a soup. Salt water. Salt water, is there, when you dump the salt in the water, is there just one part of the water that's salty? No, and it'll spread equally, right? There won't be like some saltier parts than others. It, it'll diffuse throughout it. Well, not only does this do it in liquids, but it does it in food. So when you're working with, let, let's just, we'll kind of go through each of these different individual ones. When you're working with meat, the, if you salt a piece of meat, is it going to be saltier where you put the salt or inside the meat? Is there salt inside the meat already? Very little, right? I mean, you just taste a piece of meat that hasn't been salted. It's not going to be salty, right? So there's very little salt. So where, using the principles of diffusion osmosis, what is that salt going to do then? It's going to go into the meat, right? It's going to be drawn into the meat. The other thing that's going to happen as the salt comes in, that, remember, is one way of balancing is the Salt will go in and diffuse, but the water will also come out of the meat to balance it. So it will pull the water to the surface and make the meat juicier. So when you salt a piece of meat, the earlier you do it, the juicier it will be and the more complete the flavor will be because it will be throughout the entire thing. So when you're cooking a piece of meat, you should salt it at least a day ahead of time at least a day ahead of time. For any meat that's a, a harder meat, a chicken, beef, pork, any of that variety, a fish, no. Fish you're only gonna do about an hour or even less before. You just kinda think about the thickness. You know, if you're thinking diffusion, how long is it gonna take to get through this, this piece? Um, less time. This is how you make it taste great. And this is how you make it so you don't have to cook it too much because it already tastes good before you've even almost started cooking it. So this is how you take, make a piece, a piece of meat taste good. Now green beans, this is a really interesting one. I think two, three, four years ago I learned that if you salt the water that you're cooking the beans or uh, um, add any green vegetable in there. So broccoli, green bean, asparagus, all of those kinds of things. If you salt the water that you're cooking that in, that the vegetable will, will stay green. It works, but I had no idea why. The reason is this, because if you have salt in the outside of the water, well, let's start first. If you don't have salt or much salt in the water that you're cooking it in, the minerals from the green bean are gonna leave the bean and go to balance the water that it's cooking in. Have you ever ended up with green water and gray green beans? <laughs> yeah. Yep, it's because all the minerals got pulled out of the bean and put into the water. So you would be better off drinking the water you cooked it in rather than eating the bean you cooked because that's where all the nutrients are now. So you have to keep the mineral balance or the salt balance in order so that the minerals stay in the vegetables you're cooking. This is one of the biggest things I see. I'll go to family gatherings. Someone will be assigned to cook vegetables. I pretty much just sign up always to cook vegetables now because I know they're just not going to be edible. <laughs> but isn't that the problem? Isn't that the problem? That's why people don't like to eat vegetables because they don't taste good. This is why they don't taste good because the minerals are being pulled out of the vegetable rather and into the cooking medium rather than staying in the vegetable because you've filled that cooking medium with salt or with the flavor enhancer. The vegetables will stay delicious. They will stay nutritious. They will be crisp. You will want to eat more and more and more and more of them. So what about steaming? You have to have salt in that water that you're steaming with. Mm -hmm. so it's still mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. It just has to be whatever you're cooking it in. Yep, so you have to have it in that medium so that it stays in the vegetable you're cooking. 
The other thing is, um, so, you know, I talk about vegetables. People don't like to taste them. You know, they don't taste good. Same thing happens with salad. We're going to talk a little bit about that too, but the same family, actually, Dave and Sherry, uh, one of my, uh, one of their, their daughters is my daughter's, one of her best friends. And so she comes to my house and, you know, they'll, they'll stay and you know how kids are. They'll be like, mom, can Claire stay and eat dinner with me? And half the time I'm a little nervous. I'm like, they're okay with weird food, you know, because <laughs> remember this is our house. Um, but in fact, one time I said years ago, they're like, well, what are you making for dinner, mom? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm making spaghetti. They said, normal kind or your kind? <laughs> I said, my kind, <laughs> but it's going to taste good. Yeah. <laughs> so they did have their friends stay for dinner. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this friend, this little Clara, her mom said, why will Clara eat salad at your house and not at my house? You want to know the real answer? Because your salads taste bad, you know, because they're the way, because they don't have flavor in them. So we're going to talk a ton about flavor. Salt is a, uh, also in pasta. So anything you're cooking in the water, if you want the pasta to taste like a restaurant tastes, that salt, that water you cook it in has to literally be salty like the sea. That salty, if you want it to taste like a restaurant tastes. It's what gives the depth of flavor to everything you're cooking. Do not forget about salt. Let's talk about the different kinds, though. So never, ever, ever this, okay? Never, ever, 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 ever this. This is simply chemical byproduct made from manufacturing. It's just sodium and chloride stuck together synthetically. This is not what you want. You want to have some salt. <laughs> Apparently, I'm mostly out at home right now. Um, you want to have, I love real salt because it has all those flecks of things or minerals. They're going to keep your food balanced with minerals and full of minerals. Does anyone know the difference between kosher salt? Well, between these to start with. Anyone know the difference between these? Well, the difference is the, the size of the particle and the shape of the particle. Kosher salt is in sheets. It's flat. So they, they originally did kosher salt to salt meat. Um, I have a friend, a good friend that's Jewish. In fact, well, I don't know how to pass this around. I, need, I do know how to pass this around. <laughs> pass that around and look at those crystals. Yeah. I have a good friend that's Jewish, and so she's, she's taught me a lot about what kosher means. She points out kosher everywhere. If you start, ooh, this is open. I did this at home. Now I have salt on the floor at home and here. Perfect. <laughs> that's good. Uh, anyway, she's, she's always pointing out to me on, every, on everything the little kosher mark. I didn't even know what to look for before. Um, but uh, in fact, there it is right there. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a couple different ones. But the, the reason kosher started is because it was the way, um, the way through Jewish law that they handled meat. There's a couple of different things they do. It's the way they bleed the animal. It's the way they salt the meat. It's all those things. So, so kosher salt was originally made for that. So it's flat because if you think about flat on a piece of meat, it's going to increase the surface area of the salt contact. Does that make sense? The problem is, is that when you use salt, if you just use it by the recipe, I mean, look at those crystals that are going around. If you just use it by the recipe and it says one teaspoon of salt and you use a teaspoon of kosher salt, it's going to taste half as salty because the kosher salt takes up more room in that teaspoon. Does that make sense? Because there's more air space between it. So it's going to sit on top of each other and it's not going to be nearly as salty. You cannot use a measuring spoon for adding salt to your food. The only measuring spoon that you can eat, use is right here. you got to taste for it. you got to taste for it. Um, oh, there's the screen. The, the kosher, what is the difference? We already talked about that. Real salt, Himalayan salt. What's that? Even though it's bigger, it has less flavor. So because it more. stacks up without being as dense. Does that make sense? Think, Think about, about this kind of salt all together. You're going to get way more of it in that teaspoon than the kosher salt that has gaps and spaces as it stacks up. Yep, so kosher salt's not going to be as salty in a recipe. as So who knows what salt they used when creating that recipe, and they said a teaspoon of salt. We don't know. That's a good question. Do you know? I, I don't know this answer either. Uh huh. That sea salt isn't as much as you want. That's a great question. I don't know where this comes from. Where does kosher salt come from? Kosher salt? You can find it in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. No, and actually, so I prefer this 
because I know where it came from. This was actually from a salt mine in Peru. <laughs> you know, it's a pink salt. It's from, it's from the earth and it still has minerals in it. Um, that's just the basic rule is don't ever use this. Use something that has minerals in it and a depth of flavor that you can add. Never blue box. <laughs> how much until it tastes good? And how much is how much? Like I just dumped this on the table so I'll be able to show you, but this is a finger full. You know, that's a finger full. Oftentimes when you're doing meat, you want to do palms full, which is double, triple this even. It's going to be way more than you think. It's going to be way more than you think. So you salt it before you cook it and then salt it before you eat it? You probably, no, 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 you don't want to. If you're adding salt when you eat it, you've not done your job as a cook. That's. See cooks do that. They salt it before. But not. But not much after. They're doing it before because when you do it after, the flavor's on the surface. When you do it before, the flavor's inside. Can't do it lightly more for the texture of the meat. Exactly. Not They'll add a little bit of kosher for the crunch, mm -hmm. not for the flavor. Yep. So it's when you want it deep inside of that food, that's where you're going to get that flavor. That's where you're going to get the flavor. Second one is fat. Oh, yes, good. <laughs> Okay, that's a good question. So it depends on when you do it. That's actually a misnomer that it will make the meat tough. You need to do it way beforehand. Okay. If you just do it right when you're cooking it, that's actually true. But you need to salt it a day ahead of time. So you can marinate it in salt. Is that what your part is? In essence. Mm -hmm. okay. In essence. Yep. Yep. Right. You're going to bring the full flavor all the way to the inside. Okay. Yep. Yep. And this, this Thanksgiving, I cooked the turkey. And um, I did a lot of these prints pulls and cooking the turkey. I did not brine it, but I salted it a day ahead of time. I wish I'd even done it two heads days ahead of time. Everyone was like, this is the most flavorful, juicy turkey I've ever had in my life. Yep, it makes an absolute difference. I put a lot. I probably put half of this bowl. I had two turkeys, though. But um, I probably put at least half of this bowl, maybe even more on top of it. A so lot. Did you do it under Nope, just over the top. It'll go through the skin. That's the beauty of osmosis. Yep. <laughs> Didn't know it could be such a beautiful principle, huh? Nope. Nope. I salted it the day ahead on the surface. Brining would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But brining it, you have the water, and it may actually, well, it probably will push it a little further in, perhaps even, because it's going to balance the water, so it's not going to pull the water out of your turkey to go balance the salt. So it may even be better. Yeah. I just had done that once and I had to use a whole big bucket and it was a lot of work and so I didn't do that again. Okay. Michelle, yes. the same thing on pasta, you said put it in water, but I've heard that you're supposed to wait till the water boils before you add the salt. If you add the salt before it boils, it'll boil faster. Exactly. It reduces the boiling point of the water. There's no reason. No. Go ahead and add it beforehand. The, the water will boil faster. Food will cook faster too if it's salted. Yep, like yep. It takes 7.2 seconds off of each minute. I, I learned that in school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, my mom does not know how to cook. <laughs> That's okay. None of us do. <laughs> All right, so what is fat for? It is to add flavor in foods, it's to cook in, and it's to give texture. Fat does not make you fat. <laughs> I love it. How many of us went through the 80s? That's all we learned in the 80s. How many of us ate snack well cookies? Because they had to be amazing for us because they had no fat. I was raised by a mother who was fat phobic. Is, that's a not a was, is, it's an is. Is fat phobic. She cut, cut off every speck of fat on every piece of meat she ever ate. We burned the sausage till it was black. I mean, she does not like fat because this is what we were ingrained with is fat makes you fat. Fat does not make you fat. Fat does a lot of other good things for the food. It helps to bring texture, flavor. It helps bring a lot of things. And we need fats. We need good fats in our body. Every single cell in your body has an outer layer and that outer layer is made of fats. If you do not eat good fats, it will be made of whatever fats it can find. If you eat saturated fats, it is like wrapping every cell in plastic. So guess what doesn't happen once you've wrapped every cell in plastic? 
osmosis diffusion. Nothing, nothing goes through the plastic anymore. So you cannot eat those poly, what are they, the polyunsaturated fats, the kinds where they take a, a bit of oil and they cook it till it's now plastic. That's the kind you do not want to eat. Yes, hydrogenated oils. Yep, those are like wrapping every cell in plastic. Cells aren't going to work anymore. And they turn over that plastic? Yes, because your cells turn over. Every cell turns over. And so, yes, if you start feeding yourself good fats, they'll replace it. So what are some of the good fats? Olive oil is a fabulous oil. Um, the problem with olive oil is it has a very low smoke point. So what does smoke point mean? You know what that means? It's when it starts smoking, exactly, at the, the heat at which it starts smoking. And then, yes, I heard denatures. It denatures the fat molecule. When that happens, the fat molecule is now rancid. Have you heard the word rancid? Basically, it's not going to be used by your cells the way it should anymore. Now it's a toxin rather than a healthy fat. So you do not want to heat an oil past the smoke point, past the point that it starts to smoke. So I know a lot of people, and I, I see a lot of people on like the cooking channel and things that use olive oil for every single thing that they cook. That's not right because this smokes quite early. So you, don't, you do not want to heat this olive oil that high. A lot of times olive oil is best used uncooked or for low heat. So it's the dressing, it's the thing you put on top, it's the thing that flavors, you know, like in the pesto or, you know, that's what you add the olive oil to or low heat. It also goes rancid 12 to 18 months after harvest. How do you know when it was harvested? A good olive oil will tell you on the bottle. This one says right here, Chilean harvest season 2019, used by July 2020. Look on the bottle and see what it says because it will go rancid 12 to 18 months after harvest. Um, if it does not say that on your bottle, do not use it <laughs> because it's probably older than that and they just don't want you to know it. Um, it should be stored out of light and heat because the light and heat will also denature the, in the, the molecules in the olive oil. My mother-in-law has a big bottle of olive oil that she sits by um, the side of her stove and she's put it in a clear bottle like this, you know, clear bottle and it's probably been there for two years. Mm -hmm. And every time we're there, you know, she likes to cook my kids eggs and so she'll pour a little olive oil which shouldn't be cooked with eggs in and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. You know, <laughs> but she's too sweet. You have to eat it. <laughs> but so you just have to think about things like this. Well, the other thing with olive oil is they cut a lot of it with some olive oil. You have to be careful. So when it will give you a harvest date and a use by date, that's going to be an olive oil that they don't use. They do don't do that for. Have a shelf? No. Well, you put it in the refrigerator. Yeah, and it will harden. Oh, okay. So it'll, it'll harden what? what? If it's the, the real bread? thing. Yeah. If it's the real thing. Well, in extra virgin virgin. Uh, Higher smoke point, doesn't it? Higher smoke point? Than just the regular olive oil. I don't know that answer. I think it does. So you can use it's the least oil. processed. It's yeah. the least processed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there's other oils to use for cooking, for high heat cooking. Um, coconut oil. Coconut oil is a great one for high heat cooking. The only problem with coconut oil um, is it adds in a flavor. You know, some of them do, some of them, some of them are more than others. Um, this one, I can smell the second somebody in my house is cooking with this coconut oil. I can smell it. I can just tell. And it's not a, it's not a happy smell. Like, it's not a smell I like to smell. Um, but you can cook with really high temperatures with coconut oil. Just think about what you're flavoring. Um, MCT oil. You guys familiar with MCT oil? I read about it, but I didn't know it existed for real. <laughs> Medium chain, medium chain triglycerides, it's a liquid oil, olive oil. So we actually use this often, or sorry, liquid coconut oil. We often use this for um, like cooking eggs, things like that at the, at the stoves, at the side of the stove. Um, I think I like about that is it, it doesn't have a taste unless you buy a flavor type of MCT oil. Yeah, typically. But you can't have too much of the MCT oil. It actually will cause a detox reaction, which means real fast. So you have to say back. You have to you have to ease your way into MCT oil. You said not to use olive oil with eggs. Because think about how how high you're cooking it. So if you're going to cook it real low temperature, you're going to put on low low and just cook it super slow. Then you're fine. The better one to cook your eggs in is this butter. Then this is the best butter there is, and I'll explain why. So this is made with unless it's your own butter, <laughs> out of your own cow. Um, which, if, you, if any of you have a cow, great. Um, I don't. So this 
it says right on here, milk from grass-fed cows. Most cows and dairies are fed grains. Unfortunately, cows are ruminants, meaning they have multiple stomachs and they're not meant to eat grains. They don't work that way. Um, they have to oftentimes get antibiotics, get other things to make them not get sick because they are not getting the food that they're really meant to have. The other problem when you're fed grain is that you do not get the vitamin K out of the milk that you get when you eat milk from a grass-fed cow because the vitamin K comes from the greens. So vitamin K comes through the greens into the milk and then gets into your butter. Vitamin K is huge for, dairy, for, a teeth, for teeth development. So this is the best kind of butter you're, you can find pretty much in the grocery store. Um, you can find it everywhere anymore. What's the name of that? Kerrygold. You can find it at Costco. You can find it at most every grocery store. You can find it everywhere anymore. But even though it says organic butter? Yep, because you want to know what kind of, what food did that cow eat? So if it says grass fed? That's the key. Organic? That's the key, because organic simply means they were fed grain that didn't have pesticides or herbicides on it. Okay. It doesn't mean grass. Right. So you need to know grass or grain. That's the thing. The most nutrients are going to come from this. Butter is a great cooking medium. And who doesn't like everything cooked in butter? Yeah, it's good butter. Uh, yeah and I told my kids one time, I said, you know, we're going to, I've learned a few things about kale. I'm not as actually thrilled about that, but I've learned butter's really great. And they're like, yes. <laughs> Finally, something that we like that mom learned. <laughs> um, sesame oil. Anyone use sesame oil? Yep. Yeah, it great, gets a great, I mean, you can't put this on anything that you don't want to taste like an Asian food, right? You just can't. But yeah. anything you put on, oh man, doesn't it liven that thing up? I actually had a weird experience with sesame oil. I went to uh, Taiwan. Um, my brother served a mission there, and so we all went to go visit the country with him when he was done. <laughs> On the way home, so on the way there, you get food on the airplane that was made in the United States. But when you come home, you get food in the airplane that was made in China. It's different. <laughs> so I wasn't sleeping, you know, overnight flight, whatever. And so they were coming around with um, bowls of ramen, like, like ramen. I mean, who gets that on an airplane, right? So it's sweet. <laughs> so they had little packets of things that you could dump in the ramen. One of the packets was sesame oil. I did it and I got so sick that night, Aww. deathly ill on that airplane. I could not eat sesame oil for probably a decade, but I love it now because I forgot about that flight now. <laughs> it's far enough past me. Um, but anything you use this in, it's going to taste great. We had a boy that lived with us for three years from China. He was so annoyed with me because he's like, why do you use coconut oil to cook everything? My mother never uses coconut oil in China. Why do you use coconut oil? Because he could tell the difference in the food and the flavor of the food. He could tell the difference. So he wanted me to use sesame, sesame oil. Peanut oil is another one he really likes to use. I don't like peanut oil. Um, peanuts have problems because they're, they're grown under the ground. They, they have a problem called aflatoxin, and it's a big problem with peanuts. Peanuts are actually also very allergenic. They're not a true nut. They're a legume. They're actually very allergenic as well. I don't do peanut oil. I don't have any here, but the other oil I like to use is a grapeseed or an avocado oil. It has a high smoke point and has a neutral flavor. So I just want you to think, okay, what do I want it to taste like? What do I want to do with the fats to make it taste that way? Animal fat, lard, pork fat, high smoke point, adds flavor to the food. There's a lot of um, culinary traditions that use a lot of lard and pork fat. I don't use a lot of lard and pork fat in my house, but um, if you do, great. <laughs> just know when you can use it and know it's going to taste like a pig, whatever you add it to. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Easier to make your own, like tahini, or you can't cook it in tahini. No, buy it as an oil. Okay. Buy it as an oil. Go to the Asian store and get a whole big thing of a sesame oil, and yeah, okay. buy it as an oil. And it can tolerate the higher temperature. It can tolerate a higher temperature. Okay. And grapeseed. Grapeseed as well, higher temperature as well. Yep. And there should be a lot of this stuff in one of those handouts that's there. Yeah, that should be, have the slides, and it should say a lot of these things already there. This is the first time I've actually printed off my slides because a lot of people always complain. So, Okay, third flavor is acid. Acid is not just for the pucker. When you, okay, when someone says, oh, that food is mouth-watering, what is that synonymous for? It means tastes good, right? That's what we say it for. 
So if something makes our mouth water more, it tastes better. So what does acid do? Makes your mouth water, makes you taste good. Yes? So, and I apologize, back no, on the you're fine. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering, um, is there anything, I know some, like flaxseed oil is an omega-3 good oil, but you don't really cook with flaxseed nope, oil. No, that's going to be a dressing oil again. Right. Is there anything that's a cooking oil that has, what's the highest, do you know what's the highest content of omega-3 that's a good cooking oil? Probably avocado, and then you're going to be what you're cooking it with. So like a salmon, something like that, but has a lot of high omega-3s in the food as well. That's going to bring those fats out of that food. Okay. Yeah, avocado was for sure. Okay. So acid, so just like salt was a flavor enhancer, acid is a flavor balancer. I want you to think about this. This is a really interesting example. So if you're making lemonade, fresh lemonade, you have lemons, fresh squeezed lemons, and you have water, and you put them together. It's going to taste what? Puckery, right? Um, when you add the sugar, what does it do? Now it tastes amazing, right? So it balances. Actually, you could do it opposite. If you have just sugar and water together, it's going to taste super sweet. But if you add the lemon, it's going to balance the flavors that are in there. So salt enhances, acid balances the flavor. If you think about your favorite condiments, most of them will have an acid component because acid livens up the food balances everything else out. So some examples of acid, vinegars, apple cider vinegar. This is one of my very favorites that I use a lot, rice vinegar. The reason I use it a lot is because it's very mellow. You can add it, you can add that acid component, but it doesn't, it doesn't taste like too much. Um, this was a umi plum vinegar. It, it, it's good. It's, um, it's almost gone. Um, but it's more of an Asian flavor, a balsamic vinegar, more of a Mediterranean flavor, a little sweeter, right? So you just have to kind of think about the flavor profiles. Lemon, very, uh, you know what a lemon tastes like. There's some other versions of, of acid, though, you can get, too. Um, pickled foods, those are acidic. Cheese, have you ever thought about cheese being acidic? Cheese is acidic. So when you add cheese to a dish, you're adding an acid component. The more aged the cheese, the more acidic it is. So the more acid you're going to get. Wine is acidic. A um, couple of different versions of wine. It's an Asian wine. We do a lot of Asian cooking at our house, so I've got a lot of weird Asian things, weird Asian condiments in my house. But these are all things that can add an acid component. Okay, so we've talked a lot about that. Now let's talk about actually designing a meal and some foundations. We, and you needed to know this before we could design a meal. That's why we had to go there first. This one, if you came to a couple times ago, I did another one on food and I talked about this. I'm not going to talk at length about this. I'm going to just talk at basics about this. When you eat a protein food, so a meat, a cheese, um, even a soy falls into this category. When you eat a protein food, it requires acidic juices to digest that food. When you eat a grain or a carbohydrate type food, it requires alkaline juices to digest that food. So if you put meat and potatoes in the same meal, in the same gut, one requires acid, one requires alkaline, and they're going to basically balance each other out. So you're going to have much poorer digestion if you combine those two things in a meal. Now I know, what's the, what's the standard American meal? Meat and potatoes, right? Unfortunately, meat and potatoes causes a lot of digestive upset. So, what do you do? I pick either a grain meal or a meat meal. You can add veggies to either. So, we're going to talk through this a little bit. Grain or veggie, a grain and veggie and a meat and veggie. I do this with my family and they don't even really notice or say anything about it. Sometimes you got to get a little creative, but we're going to talk about how to be a little creative with it. Grain and veggie, meat and veggie. Remember that one. What do you have time for? Most times, it's probably less than 30 minutes in my life. Unless I've really planned ahead and I've put it in a rice cooker and a crock pot, which are two of my lifesavers. A lot of times that is. And then it's still probably less than 30 minutes because I didn't take more than that to put it in the rice cooker and the crock pot and then left it for the day. More than 30 minutes. So these are the options that we're going to go through. And it's going to sound super simplistic, and it is. But you'll be amazed. We could probably figure out 100 different versions of meals or more off of just this list right here. So if you have less than 30 minutes, these are my four go-tos. Stir fry, rice bowl, salad, or soup. Boom. If there's more than 30 minutes, these same things plus another. <laughs> so you get a stir fry plus a little egg drop soup on the top of it, you know, or with it. Just something like that. So you're just going to combine one of these plus another thing if you have a little bit longer than 30 minutes. But you're going to find that a lot of the meals here are a meal. They're a whole meal. What do you want? So the third thing we're going to consider is what taste do you want? Or flavor profile, if we're on a fancy cooking show, what do you want it to taste like? 
So I've just given you some examples here. Um, I find that the ethnic cooking versions of things have the most flavor. Why do we call American food American food? Because it's bland and it's boring. But Americans came from all these other places. So why aren't these just all American foods? <laughs> you know, because we're made from all these other people. But I find it interesting that oftentimes the food we consider American is maybe the least flavorful of all of them. So what flavor do you want it to taste like? Okay, so let's design some meals. Laura, will you be our writer on our board? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to pick. Do we want to do a grain or a meat meal? Meat. meat. Okay, meat meal. Write down meat. Okie dokie. Do we want it to be less than 30 minutes or more than 30 minutes? Let's just say less. <laughs> less. Always less. <laughs> Always less. <laughs> a, a column? Yep. Okay, <laughs> what flavor profile do we want? What do we want it to taste like tonight? Just yell one of them out. I love Asian. Asian? Chinese? Okay, so Chinese. Okay. So let's think about what. Oh, we have to go back actually. Oh, less than 30 minutes. We said less. Which thing in less than 30 minutes do we want? Do we want a stir fry, a rice bowl, a salad, or a soup tonight? Soup? We want a soup tonight. Okay, so less is soup. Yeah, just put yeah, put it down there. Okay, so we want a Chinese soup with meat in it tonight. Okay? <laughs> so okay. what are we going to use? Group. What's that? We're a fun group. <laughs> We're a fun group. <laughs> We're a fun group? Exactly. So, I've got to get well, the find. Be... Well, no, we'll go back. It's in, my, it's in my handout. That's where it's at. I'm like, where is it? It's not in here. It's in the handout. So I need a handout. You can change it to a stir fry. I can change it to a stir fry. No, no, we can make we can make a soup. We can absolutely make a Chinese soup. Okay, so go to your soup formula. You find your soup formula. All right. So what are we gonna have for this the base of the soup for an Asian soup? A broth. A broth, right? So broth. Let's put chicken broth. Okay. So we're gonna have chicken broth. What veggies are we gonna put in an Asian soup? Okay. Snow peas? Onions, olives, garlic. Onions? Onions. Garlic? Mm -hmm. What was that? <laughs> some, side of, some sort of green, some sort of Asian green. And Asian green is probably going to be a little tougher green. Should we call it a bok choy? A bok choy would be beautiful in that. Okay, mm -hmm. how about a carrot? Yeah. Carrot fit in Asian? I mean, you just think. So you got to go to the restaurant. Go to the restaurant. What would you see in a stir fry? Scallions. Scallions? Okay. Like mushrooms. mushrooms? Mm -hmm. Okay. How about a tomato? Maybe no, a tomato that would mix? No? no? Okay, no tomatoes. We're, we're, nix <laughs> we're nixing the tomato. Never mind. Okay, we asked for meat in this one. So what kind of meat do we want in this? Chicken broth. Chicken? Okay. So we got a chicken vegetable soup so far. How are we going to make this taste Asian? Coconut milk would make it taste Thai. Sesame oil. Asian is Thai. Soy sauce. You think, what would you have at a restaurant? You'd have some sesame oil, you'd have some ginger, you'd have some soy sauce. Hoisin sauce. Hoisin sauce, something like that. You need a salt, a fat, and an acid. Do we have it yet? Do we have a salt yet? We said soy sauce. Soy sauce would be a salt, right? Soy sauce. Broth has a little bit of salt too. Okay. Do we have a fat? Sesame oil. I think sesame oil on top as a dressing on the top of that soup would be beautiful. Sesame oil. And the chicken and the broth has the fat. Do we have an acid? This soup's going to taste dead without it. A rice vinegar or a lime? Mm -hmm. A rice vinegar or lime? Lime. I'm going to go with lime. Okay, guess what? You just made a Chinese meat vegetable soup that's going to taste delicious, and you made it in 30 minutes or less, and you did not have a recipe. And there are no grains in it. And there's no grains in it. Okay, let's do it again. Okay. <laughs> look at how good I write on the board. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna look. Yes, there is a difference between lime and lemon. But the only difference, the only difference is the flavor. Well, like little kids eating like lime cookies. Lime goes better. What does lime go better with? Lime is typically in Mexican food. It's in Thai food. Most Asian recipes are going to have some lime. Where, is the, where are you going to find the lemon? Mediterranean foods. Mediterranean foods. This is go to your restaurant. You've got to go to the restaurant. You've got to think, what would the restaurant have? 
What would the restaurant have? OK. All right. We already did a meat, so let's do a grain this time. Grain. OK, do we want a stir fry, a rice bowl, a salad, or a soup? Stir fry. Stir fry. We want a grain stir fry. That's beautiful for grain, because then you can put it on something. Oh, <laughs> OK, what flavor profile do we want this time? I was going to say something. Mediterranean. Know. Mediterranean it is. I'm writing med. Like club med. OK. Go to your stir fry formula. What oil are we going to cook it in? Because we're going to cook it in an oil. It's met. Go ahead, what? Now, olive oil would make sense, right? Because this is a Mediterranean oil, but are we going to cook a stir fry in it? No. no. So we're going to get a neutral oil to cook it in first. We're going to get an avocado oil, something like that to cook it in, OK? What vegetables do we want? Oh, I got to talk about something here, but in, in a moment. I know, that, that has problems. OK, what? Avocado oil. Avocado oil. What vegetables are we going to put in a Mediterranean stir fry? Broccoli. Broccoli. Carrots. <laughs> She's not writing it unless she believes it. <laughs> She's censoring your answers. Suddenly, I have the power. For sure, olives, but this is a stir fry. I know, this is getting weird. I don't know that the Greeks do stir fry. Well, you can, though. OK, Let's just keep doing it then. winter squash, I think, or, sorry, uh, summer squash. Summer squash, that's a very Mediterranean-y thing. Probably do zucchini. Mm -hmm. For sure you need an onion. You always need an onion, some garlic, mm -hmm. especially a Mediterranean, right? How about a tomato on a Mediterranean stir fry? Fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure, right? Mm-hmm. Some truffles. <laughs> some truffles? <laughs> that might not fit in the budget anymore. <laughs> yeah. I love a spinach. A spinach and a stir fry, right? A spinach is really good in there. Just think, what would you have? And if you run into a trouble, what I always do is I'll type Mediterranean stir fry, and I'll just go quickly glance through all of them and go, oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, there, there, there's right. And now I don't need the recipe anymore because you have it in your head. OK, we don't want meeks. We're doing a grain. What's the grain? Well, I'm Let's get fancy. How about orzo? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> that's Mediterranean, right? What are we going to use for a sauce? Olive oil, a little balsamic vinegar, a little lemon maybe. You can add cream to any meal, but Mediterranean to me, I would say yes. However, you need to think, OK, do we have salt, fat, acid, heat? And do we have too much of one thing? Sometimes cream in a meal overpowers the acid for me. Or yeah, it's too much of the fat and too little of the acid. But you just have to think about that. So OK, do we have a salt? Wait, wait, she's probably also asking for the food combo question. Ah, uh, OK, no, so we're in a grain one. Thank you for asking. Yep, 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 yep. That was, I'm glad you asked that. OK, do we have a salt? That olive that somebody said would be a great topper on this. Yeah. And that's nice and salty, right? Parmesan cheese would be great. No, no. No, no. It doesn't match. Feta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not goat feta? Depends on if you're sensitive to lactose. If you are, then you need to have goat feta. <laughs> you, you would not like this, then. This is some goat gouda straight from Amsterdam. <laughs> OK, do we have a fat? We have olive oil. Olive oil and avocado oil and the feta. OK, do we have an acid? Balsamic. Balsamic. And I think we probably should put a little squeeze of that lemon. The olives are going to be a little bit of that too, right? The tomato. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The tomato is going to have that. OK, you just made yourself Mediterranean stir fry without a recipe in 30 minutes or less. I'm just hungry. <laughs> Then stick with the meat meals. Okay. Stick meat and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> have this just not over orzo, just have it over lettuce. Orzo is a tiny little pasta. Well, it's like a little. Over meat. If she's, if she's, yeah, just switch it. Just put it over chicken and skip the grain. Or put it over lettuce. Just put it over a bed of lettuce instead of the grain. Yep. 
So you can do the exact same thing. Yeah. Sure. Or next to lettuce. You don't have to have it over anything. Yeah, just have it next to it. Yeah. So what I did tonight, I just had a salad. Yeah, plus a, Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for saying that. Okay. <laughs> we do need to talk about something because, in fact, this was funny. I was teaching a class at, a, I think I was teaching a class at Real Foods one time, and I actually was making stuff. And a person that was in the class had been a patient of mine for years, and she said, you cook the way you do dentistry. You do it very efficiently. I said, well, interesting. Okay. But one of my rules is that I, if you're going to cook a stir fry, you're never going to use more than one pan. I mean, hello. Most everything, you're never going to use more than one pan because then you have to wash more than one pan. Remember, nobody else is doing the washing here. So when you're cooking vegetables, you're always going to cook the hardest one first. Hardest meaning hard, you know, like a carrot. A carrot versus a zucchini. So which one are we going to put in the pan first? We're going to put, obviously, this first. Oh, thank you for just reminding myself in my brain right there. Um, <laughs> so when you cook in a pan, you want to heat the pan first. So the pan needs to be hot before you put your oil in. Then you're going to add your oil after the pan is hot, and you want it to coat the surface of the pan, and you want to watch it shimmer. When it starts to do this, then it's ready to put your food in. The reason is... If it doesn't shimmer, it's not coating the entire surface of the pan and your food is going to stick. It's also not going to coat your food. The food tastes better when every bit of it is coated with just a little bit of oil, a little bit of fat for that flavor. So you want it to shimmer in the pan before you add the food. Otherwise, you're going to steam the food. You're going to, it's not going to be what you want. So what are we going to add first? Almond oil. We're going to heat our pan. We're going to add the oil. We're going to wait for it to shimmer. Then we're going to add our food. What vegetable are we going to add first? Okay. Then what? If you had a carrot, that would definitely be next. Okay, probably here, probably even here. And then here, although this is going to be already cooked, but summer squash, then where? Tomatoes, spinach. Okay, those are going to be last. So this was a little easier one because we didn't have any hard stuff on here. But if you had, you know, a carrot, if you had broccoli, if you had um, a winter squash, any of those things are going to be added. And so what I typically do is I put them out on the counter and I look at them all. And I think, okay, which one's hardest? And that's the one I start cutting first. So I cut it, my pan's here, my cutting board's here, I'm cutting it, I dump it in. I grab the next one that's next hardest, I cut it, I dump it in. So I'm just, I don't cut everything and then start cooking. I, I cut and cook while I'm cooking. Does that make sense? Super efficient. This is how you get done in 30 minutes or less. So, and a lot of times I'm having my kids wash the vegetable, I cut the vegetable, we dump it in, another kid's stirring. You know, it's just like, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get this done, kids. So they all learn, they all learn how to make it work. So let's talk through a few more. We're going to do a few more formulas later. But tools of the trade. Okay, grocery shopping. You've probably all heard to shop around the outside of the store, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a done thing now. But I want you to think about why. What's around the outside of the store? Your produce, your meats, your dairies, your bulk products usually are going to hang out around the outside. That's what you're going to focus all of your time cooking, buying, there's very rarely a time that I actually enter the center of the store. I've thought about that often. I go, hmm, am I going to go in there this time? Nope. <laughs> you know, but this, these stinking things are in there. <laughs> it's the only time I go in there into the center of the store is to find this kind of stuff. That's it. Everything else is going to be around the outside. You need to have some staples on hand if you want quick meals. So um, my coach, love her to death. She doesn't cook a thing. I went and stayed at her house. She lives in Chicago. She said to her husband, I need breakfast at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I've never said that in my life. Okay. And he said, okay, I typically do it at 10, but I'll do it at 9. Because he goes to bed at 3 a.m. and then wakes up at 10 to cook her breakfast. It's very odd. Um, so 9 a.m. came. I was already up and working. I was sitting at the table. 9 a.m. came. She came. She sat down. He walked up to her. He put down a napkin her silverware, her cup with water in it, and he said, food will be five minutes. I thought, how do I get one of these? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, this is amazing. Um, he made this thing, put it out on her plate, said, uh, he said in front of me, and I thought, this is so awkward. Like, what do you need help with? Can I, like, he didn't even let me do my dishes. It was so weird. But, I mean, it, it was great, but he shops every single day. 
because he just loves it. He shops every day for that night's meal. That would kill me. Do you have time to do that? I go grocery shopping every three weeks or so if I absolutely have to. I mean, I just don't ever grocery shop for a couple of reasons. I don't have time. But the second is when you go, you always buy more than you need. Always, always, always. So the less you can go to the grocery store, the more money you're going to save. It's just proven. It's true. So these are some staples. I think they're written down your thing, so because this is a lot of small writing. This is what I have on hand. I could probably cook you a version of anything on that list without ever going to the grocery store. The only thing that needs to be added is the vegetables. That's why you're going to shop around the outside of the store. You're going to add the vegetables. That's about it that needs to be added in. So I always keep, you know, grains on hand, legumes on hand. Those are the cheapest versions of everything too. The stuff that you make yourself. Soy sauce and, uh, sauce and dressing ingredients. So my son just got engaged and um, he, his fiance we were doing something at our house and we, we invited a bunch of people and you know everybody was deciding what they were gonna make and she said, you make the salad because your salad always tastes so good. And I was like, it's because the dressing. Because I don't have a dressing that comes out of a bottle. We just make the dressing, you know. My kids always know, I'm like, just go make a dressing, okay. You know, they'll grab four of these bottles, dump it together in the blender and now we have dressing. Um, so keep those ingredients on hand. Long storage produce. You don't have to go to the grocery store sure. every week if because garlic, onions, sweet potatoes, lemons, limes, carrots, cabbage, those will all, oh, that was loud. <laughs> those will all sit in your grocery, in your fridge or in your pantry for a long time, right? You don't have to buy those very often. They'll sit for a long time. You can make a lot of meals off of garlic, onions, sweet potatoes, lemon, limes, carrots, and cabbage. <laughs> so you don't have to go that often. Beets too, beets stay forever. Package your canned ingredients. I do get some packaged things, coconut milk, curry paste, rice noodles, some canned tomatoes just for ease, chicken broth, beef broth. Those are some things I do get. Meats in bulk if possible. Um, spices. Those are some real basic ones that you can make almost every meal off of. So we're not going to go through and detail that, but that's really how to save time too. Less shopping you do. No, I prefer to use the garlic and onion. But in a pinch, I'll throw in some garlic powder and onion powder. Or, you know, like we're making a dressing and the, the kids are just dying. Mom, can you just make some ranch dressing? Well, guess what? Some garlic powder, some onion powder with some almond milk and pa pa uh, parsley. You've got a ranch dressing that looks exactly like what they had in the, from the grocery store. That's way better for them. So sometimes those things are used in something like that where a real garlic and onion wouldn't be. Garlic powder, onion powder. If I have something a little thicker, I'll throw it in like a yogurt because it gives it that thick consistency. Plain. Yeah, plain. I don't, I don't ever get anything that's really flavored because if you don't get it flavored, then you can flavor it yourself in any way you want. So if I'm ever going to buy a yogurt, I'm just going to get a plain yogurt. Kids can add something to it to make it sweet. We can add you know, something to it to make savory. Just get the plain versions. They're cheaper too. What's parsley too? Parsley. Parsley because it makes it look like ranch. Because those little green flecks, ranch has it in it. <laughs> yep, it's tricky. <laughs> What's that? Salt. Salt. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Ooh, dill would be delicious. That gives the green flecky things too that make it look like ranch. Delicious. Yep. Okay. No. So some sort. Yeah. I mean, you could. Easily could. So. The yogurt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good oil. Okay, some of the tools that are time-saving. Rice cooker, crock pot, I could not live my life without those two things. And it's, like, it's kind of funny. So here at the office, we've been through a lot of different things as far as feeding people. And um, I like to feed people because it makes them happier and then they work harder, okay? <laughs> don't listen, that's not, you don't know that's really the reason I feed you. <laughs> so we went through a lot of different iterations of what we did for feeding. Now we're down to... I go to Costco once a week and I buy only things that we can cook in a rice cooker and a crock pot here. And how many different versions have we had? <laughs> like so many different things. And it can be made in the four hours from sometime, sometime, uh, time somebody gets here and time lunch time. High speed blender, could not live without it. Good knives and cutting board. I'm sorry, but you just cannot live without a decent knife. Um, this knife, I didn't write it on there, but this is from a company called Chef's Knives To Go. If you do not, have not asked for a Christmas gift yet, <laughs> ask for one of these. So this is a, uh, it start, starts with a B. I don't remember the name of this, but I love it. 
because it protects the knife in the knife drawer. Does that make sense? It you know stays on here and now they can bang around in the knife drawer and that doesn't get ruined or anything else. This thing is so sharp. Oh my gosh, it like makes me want to cry almost. It's so wonderful. <laughs> it saves so much time when you're cutting with a knife that's sharp and hand fatigue and all of those things. I now look forward to cutting vegetables because I think oh, I get to use my knife if I cut those vegetables. Do you have to sharpen it during that time? So I have a secret too. There's a man in Georgia that I send my knives to every two years and for 20 bucks, actually like 10 bucks each, he sharpens them. Yeah, because he sharpens them so sharp. Because I ruined my knives sharpening them myself because I did it bad. So I got them so bad that they almost couldn't cut anymore. So I sent them to him and now they're fabulous. This is one of the ones that I sent to him. So I think all you need, <coughs> you have to have a chef's knife. My, my mother-in-law was in the paring knife era. She used a paring knife for everything. I bought her like three versions of chef knives. They never use, get used except for when I come to her house. Um, but you have to have a chef's knife. There's just, this is actually not even a true chef's knife. I didn't bring my real chef's knife, but this is a little shorter. But you have to have at least something this long, preferably just slightly longer. Your life will be so much better. You need to have a, some sort of smaller paring knife and some sort of serrated knife. If you have those three things, that's all you need. I mean, of course, you're gonna have more just because they're fun to have, but you know, that's all you need. If you have those three things, you're in good shape and have them be sharp. Cutting board, um, wood will be nicer to your knife and will keep it sharper longer. Than plastic or glass. A uh, good peeler. Peeling's the job for kids. I've pretty decided, pretty much decided. <laughs> but I don't actually mind peeling now with this peeler. So this is a front and back peeler. It goes both directions. You know, just invest in a few quality things and your life will be so much happier. Uh, compost bucket. This might sound weird, but I, I use a compost bucket for a lot of reasons, just because you know we add it to the garden. But if you're cutting and chopping and you gotta like throw it away or throw it in the garbage disposal and run, like it's gonna, it's gonna take you time. I just have a bucket. A bucket sits right next to the cutting board and you cut, you, you know, you're throwing in as you're cutting. And then you feed your chickens or you feed your garden or you feed whatever, so it does all kinds of good things. Big bowls, little bowls. This bowl is probably a meal for us maybe three weeks, uh, three days a week. This is it, this is all that we eat. The beauty of this is the rule is the bowl you eat in is the bowl you wash. So you eat in the bowl, you eat in the bowl, you get up, you wash the bowl, you dry the bowl, and you put it in the counter. Guess what? Our dishes are now done. So this is so simple. So a big bowl and a little bowl. These feed us three to four days a week. Um, where do you get them? Asian market for cheap. You can serve a Mexican stir fry in an Asian bowl. I've proven it can happen. <laughs> sell them on Amazon, but the Asian markets are so stinking fun, you just gotta go. <laughs> There's one called, is it called World Mart or Asian Mart, Asian, Asian something in Salt Lake that you just, you need to go on a date night because it's so entertaining. It's so entertaining. It's, it's got like pans. almost like a strip No, 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 that one's 30th South. No, this one's like 90th and way West. I can't remember, I'll have to find it and we'll have to email it out, Laura. There's like pans big enough you could cook your children in them. I mean, they're huge. It's, it's the most fun place anyway. Um, wok. I don't bring my wok, but that's where, you, that's where you get your wok is at the Asian market. A good pan. So you don't want one that's a, um, that's a nonstick pan because remember we learned about what nonstick means. It means your oil is coating the pan completely. And when you do a nonstick pan that's a Teflon or anything like that, it's proven, you know, because it comes off, right? Eventually you see through it. It's, you're not eating that and they're finding that that's getting deposited in cells and it's a toxin and it's really bad for your body. So you want a, no, a, a, a naturally non-stick surface. Cast iron is great for that. Um, this is a titanium. Um, me, this, this I think I got maybe five years into marriage. I've probably been using this exact same pan for 25 years. So once you get it once, you don't need it again. It looks lived in. It does. Pyrolux. Say it again. Pyrolux. P Y R O L U X. It says made in Denmark. So my sweet husband does not cook, but he buys me things that I can cook with. <laughs> what? 
that's called old food over 25 years. <laughs> it's exactly right. No, this had no coating. <laughs> a spiralizer. If you don't own a spiralizer, that's another Christmas present to ask for. You've got to have a spiralizer. We broke our spiralizer. We had it duct taped together. Um, I finally broke down and paid the $25 on Amazon for a new spiralizer. Um, and then a lemon squeezer. And do you need all the different colors, the orange one, the green one, the yellow one? No, just get this one because it does most everything. So it'll do a lime and a lemon in this, both one. So those are some... What's that? That's why I have that, because he's not always there. Oh, if you've never used a spiralizer, you're going to love it. Have you ever seen zucchini noodles? This is where you make them. Mm hmm You put... Oh, you can make so many spirally things. So I use this when I'm doing an Asian stir fry because, in fact, I think I put that on here for, I think, the rice bowl. It calls for spiralized, spiralized vegetables, spiralized beets, spiralized summer squash. Um, so I will do beets, carrots, squash. Um, squash you can make. They have these other cool little things in here that are really hard to get out. That one makes squash lasagna because it makes flat pieces of summer squash. So you can make it for lasagna. You can do the same thing with potatoes. I don't cook with a lot of potatoes, um, regular potatoes. You can do the same thing with sweet potatoes. You can make little discs out of sweet potatoes. You can spiralize sweet potatoes. I spiralize turnips. Any hard vegetable you can put on the spiralizer and run through it. I tried to spiralize the winter squash. It doesn't, it doesn't work. No, it's too hard on the outside and soft on the middle. So is there any way you don't have I don't. I know. Did you peel it first? I wonder. If, the problem is, is it's got that center piece. The, maybe the butternut, because you get that chunk of the butternut before the bulb that you could maybe, I bet that might work. If you get a tall enough butternut, I bet you could probably make it work. Or cubing it. Okay, so let's go cut through a couple examples. A burrito bowl. So again, we're using our same recipe here. We're doing a, we're going to do a grain burrito bowl. White rice and salted water, right? So if you're going to cook it in your rice cooker, you're going to salt the water for your rice cooker. That means the salt, the flavor's inside the rice already. Black beans. Um, if you've never cooked beans in your own, like in a crock pot, you're missing out one of the cheapest possible things you could do. It's so cheap, but you've got to soak it overnight ahead of time. Multiple reasons, but the main reason is, is for you that you're caring about right now is because it's going to soften the pectins inside of that bean and you're going to be able to cook it quicker. You're going to soak it overnight. You're going to rinse off the soaking water. That's the main key. You do not want to cook it in the water that you've soaked it in. Rinse off the soaking water. You can add that if you want. You do not want to add salt. Salt will toughen the beans, but you can add a little bit of acid, and it will soften the pectin a little bit more as well. That's what it's doing is just softening up. Can so, you can do them in an Instapot. You can do them in an Instapot. My concern with an Instapot is if you've not soaked it. The soaking is actually really important for the health benefits because the, the bean, any bean, any seed has an anti-nutrient on the outside to prevent it from sprouting. So if you're just putting it in the Instapot, pushing the button, 30 minutes later you've got some cooked beans, great, but you actually have all of those undigestible things also included with them. So soak them overnight, then throw them in the Instapot. Yep. When I try to do black beans, they turn purple. Yep, they do. So they and the water turns purple. Yeah. <laughs> if you put other things in it, and that turns is that normal? That's normal, yeah. So I typically will throw in, if I'm cooking a pot of black beans, I'll soak them overnight, I'll rinse them, I'll throw them in the pot, I'll throw in a, an onion, a piece of garlic, maybe a jalapeno pepper if I want a little bit of flavor. And then a little trick too is if you add in some seaweed, you'll add in some iodine and some salt, and it will cook a little faster. And supposedly it will help with the flatulence issue. So I just throw a little piece of kombu seaweed in with it. Um, Mm. And so is, I don't know how to say it, ep epizote, I think is how you say it. Does anyone know how to say that? It's a, it's a, opposite. opposite. I knew you'd know how to say it, Carmen. <laughs> if you add that, that's supposed to help with the flatulence problem as well. It's EP, right? Flatulence, yes. <laughs> EP, it is. EPA, I believe, is it EPA or EPO? And then Z O T E. But it's an E. Is it? I've only seen it spelled E, so maybe I'm, I've seen it spelled the American way. <laughs> and then Z-O-T-E. 
A lot of Mexican food has that in it as a flavoring. It's a spice. It's an herb. And if you go to the uh, Latin market, it, it will be spelled with an A. Correct. <laughs> the correct way, exactly. <laughs> and if you've never been to the Hispanic market, to the Asian market, you are missing out. Those places are so stinking fun to shop, and they're cheap as dirt. Oh, my gosh. You'll go to our grocery store, and a lime will be a dollar a piece. You'll go to a Hispanic grocery store, and you'll get 10 for a dollar. It's like, these are the same limes. What the heck? They have the spicy flavors. Oh, yeah. They're so great. They're so great. So great. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you can kind of figure it out. <laughs> Asian market. Or, you know, your grocery store, but you're going to pay twice as much at a regular grocery store, but that's okay. I've seen them at Good Earth. I've seen them at whatever. The one I like is called Kombu, K-O-M-B-U. M-B-U. And I'll just break off a, a piece of it, throw it in there. It'll expand. It'll be five times the size of when you threw it in. When you're done, just fish it out before you mix up your beans. You can put it in your sauerkraut, too. Oh, good. And if you don't want to go all the way up to Salt Lake, it's a good one too. It's been there about six months or so, and it's an excellent one. It's straight across the street from the one she's talking about. They're both right there next to each other in Orem. It's about what, 300 north? Or is it further north? Is it 600 north? Yes, 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 yes. Where is that? Yeah, it's across the street. Yeah. About 300, it's about that, right? 250, 300 north in Orem. Yeah, it's a great store. It's a great store. And there's a couple Hispanic markets just right here in American Fork that are both pretty good. Yeah, we've gone to both. I like going them now with my boys that served um, Spanish-speaking missions because they actually know what we're buying. So that's been helpful. <laughs> um, or if you don't want to soak the beans, just buy a can of beans. You know what? I'm so not a purist. Just buy a can of beans, just rinse them because they're really salty. Um, salsa. Shredded lettuce or cabbage. Again, yeah. I keep cabbage on hand a lot because a lot of times if you haven't gone to the grocery store and your lettuce is all disgusting or you don't have any, cabbage is always in the, always in the fridge. Cabbage is a great thing. Avocado, sliced lime, corn chips. Okay, so did we do it? What's the salt? Yeah. The, corn the corn chips. Corn chips. <laughs> mm -hmm, yep. And the salted water. Okay, good. What's our fat? Avocado. Avocado. What's our acid? Lime. Okay. So is that meal going to taste good? Yes. It's going to taste good because you got everything in it that you need. All those flavors. Okay. And how long is that really going to take you? Especially if you put that rice in the, in the rice in the rice cooker and the beans over. I mean, how long is that going to take you? It's like 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm just throwing stuff in. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you put the grain and the bean together, it has both. So that's a complete protein. Correct. Is that, is that that's good because you don't have a meat in there. You don't have a protein. The carbs and carbs can go together. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it's a hamburger soup. So this is a meat meal, right? So we have ground beef. Um, so this is the way I would do it. I cook it the night before. I know sometimes it's a little depressing after you just made dinner to make another dinner. But I know, <laughs> but it's just super simple. Like if the meat's already thawed and you know, and you've already salted, it, whatever, it's 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 simple. Like this is like a ten minute thing. You can throw it in. You put it in. So this is what this is the way it would happen in my family. Okay. So I'm gonna cook the ground beef the night before. I will throw everything else in the crock pot with it. I put the whole entire crock pot in the fridge, not the part with the plug. My daughter did this a couple of weeks ago, and my crock pot has not worked well since. Um, so you, the, you need the kind that the crock comes out of, you know. She put the whole thing in. A, so I went the next morning. I'm like, I know I got that ready last night. I usually leave the, the plug part out on the counter, so then it reminds me to pull it out of the fridge that morning. And I was like, where's the crock pot? My son comes bringing it in. Liza put the whole thing in the fridge. I'm like, well, I did tell her to put the crock pot in the fridge, so, you know. So I'd put a can of tomatoes, a can of green beans. I would slice up some sweet potatoes and carrots, throw in beef broth, some Italian seasoning. That would all go in the fridge overnight. I'd pop it out. I'd put it in the crock pot in the morning. I'd push low cook for 10 hours, and I would leave. I'd come home. Dinner's ready. What am I going to cook it with? If you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that because think about how long is it going to take to cook this stuff without a crock pot. That's a half an hour or less, right? Serve it with a simple lettuce salad. You're going to put the same things in each of the dishes you want to think about. Either as a whole, you want to have it. So where's our salt in this meal? The broth, the canned, the canned vegetables. You're, probably, you're going to salt your meat here, right? OK. The beef broth. Where's your fat? The beef broth. OK. 
here. A little bit here. Okay, where's your acid? Tomatoes. Your vinegar here. So you want the meal to be balanced too. You want to have all those things in that meal too. And I hope that doesn't feel overwhelming. I hope that actually feels very simple. And now it's just boom, got it, got a meal. So what, why haven't we talked about healthy eating? Oh, yes, go ahead. So did you salt your meat like the day before you cooked it? Ideally, yes. In my life, not always. Okay. <laughs> all right, if you cook your, cooked it and then you put it all in the crock pot and let it sit overnight, that salts it also? It does because it's okay. doing that wonderful diffusion thing. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so why haven't we talked about healthy eating? Because most of the things we've talked about are exactly that, right? Food from the outside of the grocery store, is that healthy? Yep. Basic food staples, are they going to be healthier than something bought in a box or a bag or a can? For sure. Healthy cooking techniques. Have we used fat? Yeah, because fat doesn't make you fat. You know, we've used, but we've cooked, we've figured out how to make foods. Are we, are we immersing the food in the fat? No. We're just using it to dress it, to flavor it, to give it texture. Um, meals at home, are those going to be healthier than eating out? Yeah. Guaranteed, right? Uh, no pre-processed meals. Eating at home with your family, that's healthy. Just because you're with your family, that's actually very health-inducing to be together most of the time. Sometimes, maybe it's not. <laughs> most of the time it is. <laughs> I have two 13-year-olds, a boy and a girl. Not always healthy, but <laughs> most of the time it is. Um, full of nutrients, right? Because you work to preserve the nutrients by the way you salted it, by the way you bought fresh produce. You work to preserve the nutrients so you eat less. You realize that? There's this thing called an apostat. It's a literal thing in your body that when it's hungry, it's hungry for nutrients. It's not just hungry for food. So your body's hungry for nutrients. If you go and eat a whole bag of Cheetos, isn't it interesting that you're still hungry? Why are you still hungry? You didn't feed your body what it needed. The apostat stays on. It says, I'm still hungry. So you eat another bag of Cheetos. You're still hungry. You have to feed it nutrients. Have you ever eaten a salad, like piled a grape cold salad on your, you know, your, your plate, and you got halfway through it and you think, I'm full. Wow, I'm full. Because you ate all the nutrients your body is looking for. Better digestion so you feel better too. So all of those things are healthy. We have talked about healthy eating because all these things are healthy. We have talked about food that tastes amazing, amazing, fills you up, can be made in less than 30 minutes, and that you can feel great about feeding your family. So there's recipes included in your handout, but they're formula recipes. So I hope you figured out that that's the way you can do a recipe. So in this little handout, you have the availability of probably, you know, 50, 60 different recipes because it gives you ideas of what to use and how to layer these things together. Let me know after, you know, if you enjoyed this. I'm actually considering this as being the next book in the Healthy You Continuum. So let me know if it was interesting to you and if you think you might like that. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> yes? What about regular food versus organic? Good question. So the difference is going to be, was it grown with pesticides, herbicides? That's the main thing. So there's actually a thing called the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 from the Environmental Working Group. So when I'm looking at vegetables in a grocery store, I am going to buy, so if you don't know what this is, the, the, the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen, they find the 12 most contaminated um, items of produce for the year. Strawberries have topped the list for many years, okay? That means they have, I will never eat a non-organic strawberry. I just won't. I know, that's a rule that I, I just, it's hard, but I won't because they're number one. They're number one on the list. You wash them? I rarely will eat a strawberry because of it, honestly. They can't wash it off. It's inside it. So anything on the Dirty Dozen, I'm going to try to buy organic. It's going to be more expensive, but that's why anything on the Clean 15 list, I'm not going to buy that organic. Bananas are on there. Why would I buy a banana, an organic banana? If a non-organic banana they've proven isn't contaminated with pesticides or herbicides. Why would I do it if I'm budget conscious? Does that make sense? You know, if I have to consider it. So I look at that list and anything on that dirty dozen, I'm going to buy organic or I'm not going to buy it. I just may not buy strawberries, <laughs> you know, just because it's on that list. So that's my rule. That's my rule. I try to do, I, I grow a lot. I try to do as much as I can myself that way, preserve, you know, myself because I know how I grew it. But um, that's my rule for keeping it clean. Yeah. We haven't talked about fruit. Can you eat fruit as far as Thank you for asking that. No. Fruit is on its own. Fruit is on its own. 
the, yes, eat it or before the meal. So now what I do is like uh, in the summertime when we had, you know, watermelons and cantaloupes and things coming out of the garden, I would go pick one of those, I would cut it up and I would snack on it while I'm cooking or while the family comes in and they're like, I'm hungry, great, eat the watermelon because that's when it happens. So the way I've heard it phrased that I like this is food, if you think about it, is kind of on a train track. It has to go from here down to the bottom, <laughs> okay? Um, some foods are fast moving trains. Some foods are slow moving trains. The fastest moving trains are fruit. Melons are the fastest moving train. So you never want to eat a melon with anything else. And it always has to be first. So a melon's got to go in first because if, if you eat a big meat meal and then you eat watermelon as your dessert, the watermelon's backing up behind the meat going, come on, come on, come on, get it, go, get it. That's where you feel bleh. <laughs> It, and the sugar is going to ferment because it's staying way too long in the stomach and now you feel nasty. So fruit has to go in first and it has to be by itself. Which is hard because like all those yummy things you want to put on a salad, you know? Yep, we just don't do them anymore. Now we eat them as the appetizer. And nuts and Nuts can work for either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can be a fat or... They can work for a meat or a grain. Yep, so often they're the topping on things, they're the crunchy piece. You know, the sunflower seeds, the pumpkin seeds, whatever, the, you know, they go on top. Yep, and they're a great source of fat. Mm -hmm. I have a quick, can you do a quick guess when you talk about that oatmeal? Mm -hmm. Does that have to be soaked overnight so that the phytic acid comes out? Like a if you're using the whole grain that you're ground up yourself, yes. If you've not, soaking is helpful to get that off, but it's not going to have as much. So if you're using like a rolled oat, then it's not going to have as much of that phytic acid as if you're taking an oat groat and grind it up in a blender and then cooking it, which is what we do a lot because it's cheaper too. Um, but uh, a rolled oat is not going to have as much of the problem. It is better if you can soak it though. What do you soak? Oats. Just put them in the like pan. Steel cut yeah, put them in the pan the night before. That's, this is oftentimes we do the very thing, last thing before we go to bed. You know, we put the oats, we put the um, little bit of salt. Actually, my, my daughter cooked oatmeal today and she didn't put salt in and it was amazing the difference in the flavor. It was just, all, ugh, it just didn't taste good. It didn't, didn't matter what I put on top, it just didn't taste good. But put a little bit of salt, put a little bit of water, put the oats in the pan, and then the next morning you add some more water to it, cook it, and you've got breakfast in four minutes. Is this the cabbage that we ate? I don't know what was on there. Yeah, I'll have to look at that one. Ah. So that's if you don't soak it, then you oh, can add that. Okay, yep. that yes, we have them somewhere. <laughs> we have somewhere to sell over there. Yes, good. Thank you guys again for coming. Go eat some food if there's some left over there.